So welcome to the Writer Center's virtual craft chat series, where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little more about how they wrote it. Uh, my name is Zach Powers. I am the artistic director of the Writer Center. Uh, and I'm also an author of fiction primarily, but some other stuff as well. Uh, and I did publish a novel, which was an alternate history. So I'm actually, it's been a little while since I got to talk, talk uh, historical fiction. I don't feel like I'm quite a, uh, an historical fiction author, but I do like talking about the subject since I had some similar experiences in, in, in working on my, uh, on my novel. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome David O. Stewart to the, to the event right now. And David, uh, uh, we, we talked beforehand. Did you have something you might want to read briefly from the book or do you want to pass on that right now and go on straight to chatting? Uh, I, I did pick something out. Um, so I'm going to try to do this. I, I warned Zach that I always uh, have trouble with this because I tend to, as I'm reading it, think, oh, gee, I wish I could change that sentence. Um, but uh, I did want to just make one quick pitch. Uh, Zach's already referred to the black boxes out there. Um, it, it reduces the alienation of our COVID experience if you actually turn on your uh, camera and those of us who are speaking to you actually see people. It, it's really nice. So if, if you can see your way clear to do that, I would be grateful. Um, okay, um, this is a story about uh, settlement in uh, the main coast, which was frontier in the 1750s. Uh, our family, they're, they're German immigrants, uh, the Oberstrasses have come uh, by ship, of course, and a young son has died on shipboard. Uh, they've just arrived. They've discovered that the promises that were made to them, many of them will be broken or already have been. They're living in a compound with their, all the other settlers, not in their own place. And our, our protagonist has injured his foot well desperately trying to work at night to build a hut for his family and get them out of the compound. Um, and um, it is uh, a, a moment when he's, uh, he, he walks down to the river. Um, everything was, uh, the, the river was everything. And that's why they were there <clears throat> uh, very early in the morning. The dawn's half-light softened to the far border between the river and the forest. With no wind blowing, the river was calm, a mirror of the heavens, even of his thoughts. He couldn't think in the shelter, surrounded by so many arms and legs, so many mingled dreams, so many smells and groans. He needed to speak to God. Clinging to the staff, he sank to his knees. Johann closed his eyes and fumbled for the thoughts that had troubled him since his accident. He had sinned again. His old sin, the one that always hung over him like a sharpened axe. The sin of pride, the first sin of Satan. It had started with Peter. That's his son who, who died on the shipboard. Um, he had been so angry over that. He still was. He hugged himself with both arms and stopped to sob. He couldn't forgive God for taking Peter. Not for that. But how could he judge God? He knew it was monstrous to judge God, for him, a sinner, to do that. But he couldn't stop. Peter had been blameless, a small child. What purpose could God have in taking him? God couldn't mean to punish Christiane. She did nothing to incur his wrath. She never would. It had to be him, the prideful soldier who stole men's lives for money. He was the object of God's wrath, the one whose sins were repaid by the blameless boy. Johan made himself look across the water. He had to face the sin. His pride hadn't ended when he left the army. When he arrived in this land, he meant to tame it in a single week. By making a show of working so hard and accomplishing so much, he meant to win favor with Christiane, with the Germans and the English, with McDonald, with Armstrong and Leichter and General Waldo. Johann had aimed to leave the settlement, to seize the place close to the general's agent that Nungesser now held, but instead he had made himself a laughingstock. He had aimed to claim his land within days of arriving here, but no land claim would be recognized until spring, if ever. He had aimed to build the first cabin, but he had to sit nursing his foot while other men worked. And winter was coming, a winter, so the English said, like none he had ever known. He sat back on his heels. God had exposed his sin, shown how ridiculous he was. Perhaps God for, 
could forgive his sin, but the colony at Broad Bay would not. He must let go of this pride. It poisoned everything. It wasn't his place to understand why Peter died. He must accept it. He could not think it was right, but he couldn't be angry with God. He must put his energy to understanding this vast and wild place. He could not change America to fit Johann Oberstrasse. He must change to suit it. That was what God wanted of him and what he owed to God and to Christiane and to Walther and the baby who was coming. He thought again of the Peter and let the tear form at the corner of his eye. He gazed down the river to the bay. This might be a cold place, but it had water and woods and land, the land that they came for. Thank you. Thank you. And I also love, I mean, I, I love Johan as a character, so I'm really glad that we got a little of his interiority there, too. Um, because I, I should say, too, that that was a very inter interior kind of scene, but Johan is also engaged in very much action for the first two books of the, the novel. So it's, 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 it's a, a, a well-paced novel that has beautiful moments of introspection with the characters like that as well. Um, I did want to mention, too, you mentioned when you read your own work out loud, sometimes you notice things. And I, I always like to say, you never stop revising, even when the book is done and published. In my, my reading copy of my novel, there are like pieces of post-it note covering out whole paragraphs I didn't want to read out loud because I realized I would have cut them had I had another couple passes as an editor or so. Yeah, I skipped a couple sentences there. <laughs> <laughs> the white out or black out, whatever you want to do to, to, yeah, to get just... out the thing you want to cut. So it's even, and I and that's most authors I know at some point. And if you read, if you do read from the same section 20 times on a book tour or at events and things like that, you're going to catch something that you would change just by, by that extra reading. Um, so uh, in your own words, David, can you just tell us who you are? Oh my, uh, I, uh, I uh, practiced law for a long time uh, and, uh, and loved it. And, and then I didn't, <laughs> and, uh, I needed a second chapter. Uh, and uh, I just sort of, I had not wanted all my life to be a writer, um, but I just thought I, I've always been a, a enthusiastic reader, uh, mostly of history and fiction. And I just thought, well, geez, I'd like to write a book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a transition and it took a while. I took some writer centered workshops to uh, learn the craft a bit and uh, learn some assemble colleagues, which is very important. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, I got after it. Great. I, I want, want to follow up on that a little bit, though, because my, similar, I, don't, I didn't have a, a long, long career, but I worked in a couple other things before I, I started writing on the side. I, I wasn't a writer until I was in my 20s, and I was working another full-time job, had a full career. I had a full decade of a career that I don't do anymore, so sort of similar thing. So I, I'm always interested in people who've had that alternate beginning to writing as opposed to people who maybe studied writing and went pretty quickly into an MFA program or pretty quickly into writing more seriously. Uh, um, so so you, were you not really doing, you, you say you weren't doing really any writing at all for pleasure, at least uh, as. You know, I had been a newspaper reporter right out of college, mm -hmm. um, which is actually spectacular training, I think. You know, just, you know, get the, the words on a page. Um, and make sense of them. Uh, then, uh, you know, as a, as a lawyer, I, I wrote a lot. That was part of the job. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a lot of briefs, a lot of motions. Um, and you discover that, yeah, I was a trial lawyer, an appellate lawyer. Um, a lot of the work is, is storytelling. And I didn't appreciate this so much until I started trying to write uh, books. But, you know, when I was closing to a jury, which is the best time of, of, the, of the whole experience, I was writing a book. I, I was, I, I put together the whole story. And, you know, of course, it, my client was the hero, um, or at least was not the villain. <laughs> Sometimes that's, just, that's as high as you could, you could shoot. Um, but uh, it was, uh, a very comparable exercise. 
Yeah, I mean, and, and also even in your bio in the book, I, it uh, uses the term storyteller, uh, historian and storyteller. And I really thought that was an apt word because as I was going through this book, there is definitely a storytelling knack in this. I mean, I mean, no, absolutely. That that's that 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 is absolutely something like, oh, this is just like this that quality of sitting around a fire being told a story. And I mean that in the most positive light, like that that quality of just like compelling natural flow storytelling was, was present throughout. So that's interesting because I was I can see how those years of practice in a very formal setting uh, maybe contribute to a slightly refined version of that organic fireside storytelling style too. So uh, that, that, that definitely comes through. That's just something I'd recommend to anyone who wants to read the book and something to keep an eye out for. Is there anything though that you wish you had done differently along the way when you were first, before you started writing formally, is there something you wish you'd done on the side that would have better prepared you? Something you realize, like, what's the thing like, oh, I wish I'd just done more of that uh, along the way. This would be so much easier now. Well, you know, there's a couple of things I didn't do that I wish I'd done. Mm -hmm. I, when I was a kid, I had a chance to go be a, you know, work on a movie set and I, I didn't do it. And that was dumb. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been a lot of fun. Uh, but, uh, you know, about the only thing looking back that I, I kind of wish I'd started writing earlier, um, just because I, I feel like there's a lot I want to write and, you know, the years get shorter and you, so you, you got to hustle. Um, and uh, I, I feel a, a, a little extra pressure from that. But, you know, I wasn't ready. So there you are. That's a good point. I mean, you know, it, Sometimes you have to get to the writing before you even begin the writing. So, um, so I sort of skipped over what's our, our usual first question uh, because we were sort of on that track right there about previous career to current career. But the first question we like to ask is some variation of what's a question that you really wish someone would ask about your writing? What's something that you, you do that maybe no one ever asked about and you would like to talk about and, and have a chance right now to, to claim that moment? I, honestly, you know, you did let me know you were going to ask this question. And, you know, the one that comes to, to mind is, you know, why do you do this? You know, why do you write books? You know, the pay is lousy. The road is paved with humiliation. Um, you know, <laughs> what's the big deal? Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's a question we, we do ask ourselves. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it's, you know, I guess you want me to answer it. <laughs> um, when I think about it, it's uh, it's it, it's a form of communication. And to be honest, it's hogging the microphone. I mean, you grab the microphone and you hang on to it for 200 plus pages. Uh, but it's a chance to have your say to create something. And it really, and it doesn't happen more than a few times in a book. I mean, honestly, a lot of times in a book, you are being a professional. You are putting it together as best you can. And I can see that with other writers. I certainly know it with me. But, you know, every now and then it just comes. You know, you just know exactly what you want to say. And it comes out and you read it the next day and it's not Drek. And you actually said what you wanted to. And you can revise it eight or nine times, but that is really gratifying. And when there's a passage that works like that, when you feel like you've gotten your arms around something you wanted to say, you wanted to express to people, you wanted to share, um, that is what keeps, I, for me, that's what keeps me coming back. Mm -hmm. How do you, did, just... Uh... Out of left field here, that made me think of how do you feel about the days, though, where it's not easy to write? Do you ever, I mean, how does that writing look the next day? Do you ever come back like something that you absolutely slogged through? Every word was a chore. You left the, the desk hating the, the English language. But sometimes I do that and go back and like, oh, that was actually okay. Like it was hard to do, but the writing, the training of being a writer came through and I was actually able to, to churn out something that was not what it felt like. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's there are times you, I, you feel like you're taking out the trash and you're you know you're wiping down the windows and 
uh, it wasn't that bad and you can fix it and, and you can make it better. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of just doing it. Uh, it uh, there was a moment in my brief journalistic newspaper career when I was unable to figure out how to write a story and I was swanning around the room, you know, being f full of angst and uh, self-importance and told some veteran, he must've been 40, I mean, he was that old, um, that uh, I couldn't figure out how to write the story. And, you know, he's, he looked at me with his cigarette dangling from his mouth, corner of his mouth and the smoke causing him to blink through the smoke. And he said, uh, first you write the first word, then you write the second word, then you write the third word. And he left. And, you know, I was pretty devastated. He, <laughs> I, I had, in fact, been a fool. Um, but I do tell myself that. And actually, I, when I was a lawyer, I always told young lawyers that when they were saying, geez, I don't know how to write this. I just, just write the damn thing. You know, we'll fix it. Um, and, and I do think exactly as you say, that there's times, you know, it doesn't feel great, but you're actually advancing the story. And, and that's, you know, and if you didn't do that that day, you'd be even farther behind. I was going to say, I think you may just have the, the new Redder Center motto, which is write the damn thing, then fix it. I really think I, I, I love that as, as, as a motto for writers everywhere. Um, Okay, so I, I did, I, uh, before I go to my next question, again, I really welcome questions from anyone here in the audience. So if you have a question, just go into the chat window and type it in and I'll get to as many as those, those as I can uh, as soon as I'm able to. So please put those in when you have a question come up. So I mentioned at the top, I was excited about talking historical fiction, uh, but I wanna start off with that is you also write history. You write formal researched history books, uh, most recently your uh, biography of, of George Washington. Uh, which came out earlier this year, as we were discussing before the event. Um, so I'm just interested in two, they're obviously related. There is a, a common thread between historical fiction and history is the elements of history that you're drawing into both. Um, but what makes you decide one subject will become a history while another might become fiction? What, what, what's, do you, is that just something you sense immediately? Do you know, like from day one, that this thing is going to be a history and this one's going to be a novel? Or is it, is there any doubt in your mind when you get started? I know pretty early um, because I, I can't find out enough to write uh, what you would call straight history. Um, my first historical novel was about the John Wilkes Booth conspiracy. And I had come upon this incredibly intriguing shard of information or impression from the investigation of the conspiracy uh, that, you know, maybe there were other people behind it, which kind of makes sense. There were 11 people in the conspiracy. Somebody had to organize that thing, and it probably wasn't John Wilkes Booth. Uh, but I couldn't prove it. I mean, it, it, you know, it's just, it just was 150 years later. Uh, so I thought, well, shoot, you know, I was always a fan of Josephine Tay's Daughter of Time, which is a great book. And uh, she sort of goes back to Richard III uh, and, and proves that he was innocent. He didn't strangle the little princes in the, in the tower. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, I, I can try something like that. So that was the one I was closest to wanting to write as a, uh, as a novel, uh, I, I'm sorry, as, as straight history. Uh, luckily, after the, the uh, publishers saw that book, they said, well, is it a series? So I had to say yes. So then I knew the others had to be novels. Um, and then these, the ones that I'm starting now with the new land, uh, they're family stories. And I do not know enough about the family to write nonfiction. Uh, you know, these people were almost, uh, uh, 300 years old uh, ago, uh, and the records are very slight. So um, th that was going to be fiction if I was going to write anything about it. Um, what are the, well, actually, I, I want to jump to research for one second, just because you mentioned that. And now I'm thinking like, 
So this is the facts of the new land might have the facts of the characters might have been s slim, but this book is full of research. I mean, there's a lot of 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 de historical detail there. So can you just sort of show share an overview of your research process for the book? Just to give someone who may be thinking of doing one themselves how, how you get started. Yeah, for this book in particular, um, it was very important to me, and I, I became enthusiastic about the notion that historical fiction is a bit like science fiction, or which I do read some of, or um, fantasy, which I don't read, <laughs> but I think maybe it is, um, in the whole concept of world building. Um, and, you know, there's a sort of catchphrase in history that, you know, the past is a foreign land, uh, and which it is. I mean, we don't know what life was really like there. You know, we've got first person accounts, we've got some old buildings left, you know, what tools they used. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, some pictures, uh, some paintings, but that's about it. Uh, and so you have to fill that in and, and you do have to build the world and you don't need to explain everything. You know, they're human beings and they're feeding themselves and they're, they have, personal bodily functions like we do, and you don't need to get through all that. But there are times it really matters. You know, if you're settling a new land, you know, how do you build shelter? How do you feed yourself? I mean, there's, there's no five and dime down the street. Uh, there's no supermarket. Um, if you don't grow it or kill it, you don't eat it. Uh, and those were things, you know, I'm not an outdoorsman. I don't know any of this stuff. So, you know, the internet is a fabulous research, resource. And I had to learn a lot of things. I mean, I, I spent days figuring out uh, a trap, you know, to, for catching muskrats and beavers and such, because it had to be simple enough that this clown could do it uh, and that I could understand it. Uh, but it had to work and it had, I didn't want anybody to, you know, write me the classic email, you know, you dope, you don't know how these things work. Um, so you have to spend some time on that. And, and I often, you know, like the, the trapping scene, I didn't know I was gonna do that until I got there. And then I realized, oh, geez, I, I need to figure that out. Uh, so it's a process. Um, I do think it's really important in this whole world building concept, though, to go to the place if you can and understand the place. Um, and because, you know, Walterboro is still pretty simple. Uh, it's a, this is the town on the coast of Maine where they, they landed. Uh, I, I could go there. And uh, there are some battle scenes up in Nova Scotia and down in uh, at Bunker Hill, and I was able to go to those places. And, and for me, that helps my imagination. Uh, and it helps me just understand what they were seeing. So you, you mentioned the trapping and another scene that jumped out for me, just that stuck with me was, was the lobster hunting scene where they're literally just going, waiting in the water and bashing lobsters with rocks because they don't know, they have no idea that these people have never seen a lobster before. This is their first attempt to catch lobsters and that's how they are doing it. Uh, and that was just a very memorable scene. I mean, how much of this is, and there's many moments like that too, I should say, how much of that is pure imagination or with the trap and how much was something you found in some resource that you then claimed for this particular scene, took it out of context maybe and, and, and inserted it into a moment that you had within the story? I found some reference to, uh, you know, that the waters were teeming with lobsters. You just couldn't get away from them. Um, so that sounded sort of wonderful at some level, <laughs> but uh, so, so I wondered, and, and then it was imagination. So, okay, you discovered that these things can be eaten and that, uh, you know, earlier settlers tell you that, you know, they're pretty good if you boil them. Uh, and uh, so how do you get them? Well, you know, they're just off the ship and you know they're simple folks and I mean, just going in and smacking them with a rock seemed pretty sensible uh and uh you know lobsters have some defense mechanisms but they're not really killers so you can take them on uh so it, it was a it was a mixture i um i mean i love that that was a process of a 
detail you found combined with imagination. Because those are definitely, when I write, that's my favorite. Like when something I find inspires me to run with it in a direction that maybe wasn't documented in any weird way, because that ends up like, I mean, I know some people say whimsy is a dirty word in writing, but I feel like there was, there was a beautiful moment of like, I won't say whimsy, but there's a just beautiful moment with that. With that, that's occurring. Like, oh my gosh, they're going to bask with rocks. I was so excited when when that when that was being revealed. So I'm very pleased to know that it was a part research, part imagination moment. Well, when I was impressed, I, I don't know. We we used to have a place on a lake, and uh, you know, I would always marvel at the ice fishermen in, in the winter. I mean, what what person wants to do that? Um, but in Maine, they did ice fish because they were hungry. Uh, <laughs> And uh, they did it right from the start and uh, did it in a very unsophisticated way. And I was able to find that. And, you know, that sort of thing, I think, adds context, tells you, gives you a feel for what, what life was like. And you, you, you don't want to stop and make it a, a lesson. But, you know, you, you, you can, if you can fold it into the story, I think it helps. Yeah, I think that's done really, really well. Um, so details like the lobster thing, are these just... Do you keep like a notebook of cool details or do you tab books? Do you, how do you, are these things you save up and like, that's cool. I might use it later. Or is it just sort of uh, when you get to a moment, you remember something and, and go with it that way. I'm a heavy note taker, although for fiction uh, less so because uh, I don't need to mm -hmm. write end notes. Thank God. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I do, uh, We'll look over the notes, and generally, uh, I can't just sit down and start making up a story. Uh, I need to know where I'm going, and so I will do an outline. A, a very accomplished novelist, I, I was trying to figure this out, and had a couple of failed novels to my credit. And I asked him, "So, how do you actually get to where you want to go?" And he said, "Well, I do it." really long outline, like 80 single space pages, which is pretty close to a book. Um, but he thought of it as an outline and that was freeing for me. And that that's what I generally do. Um, and it can have dialogue in the middle of it. It can have incidents, it can have scenes, but it also can have just, you know, quick ABCD stuff. Um, and, and as I go through that, I learn things I need to figure out and understand. Um, and then when I'm writing it, you know, I use that as a basis for writing it. But a lot of times, you know, I'll realize, oh, man, it's getting slow here. I need some, something's got to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, pace, I think, is so important. Uh, uh, or, you know, OK, we need a breather. Got, everybody's got to take a have a couple of pages of quiet time. Um, and, you know, I got to think of something. And, you know, I may sift back through my notes and see if there's anything in there I can use. And if there isn't, I got to think it up. Yeah, I, I have a similar process, I think, in terms of the notes. And like, I don't always stare at them, but occasionally like, I feel I need something. And I'll go back and oh, I forgot that about entirely. Yeah. But I also like that you had that moment with uh, the author who recommended the really detailed outlining. Uh, not that I'm recommending detailed outlining for everyone, but Sometimes I think the thing when people say it's so hard to write a book, otherwise really talented writers, maybe in a short form, it's because they haven't found that thing yet for them, which can be different for everyone. But like, if you're feeling stuck on a long project, try a detail outline, try the opposite. If you've been outlining detailed, really detailed and getting stuck, see if you can just do a very loose outline and write a lot on that. So just, just experiment with different ideas, listen to what different authors say, how they've done it. And, and, and if you're stuck, that's a great I've known so many authors who found that one thing that finally freed them to complete the long project when the long project had been eluding them. Yeah, I, I blame you, Dora Welty, because, you know, I, I love her stuff. And uh, I read a quote from her saying, well, I just get started and my characters tell me the story. So I thought, oh, well, that sounds good. Um, and, you know, if my characters knew the story, they kept it to themselves. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I just had no idea where I was going. And um, this fellow's structure has worked for me. Great. Uh, so we had first question from the chat was actually very similar to one of my questions. So I'll use the chat one is, do you research a lot before you begin or is it more, uh, is more of it done as you go along? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it, it, as I was saying, I, you, 
you do research the things you think you're going to need to know. Uh, but then, you know, uh, you know, at the, get towards the end of this book, uh, the man becomes, uh, we, we get involved in privateering, which is the sort of licensed piracy um, that was practiced in the 18th century. And of course, Maine being a, a shipbuilding area, it was logical you'd get a lot of privateers there. Um, I wasn't planning on that, but it, it worked, I thought, for my character and the story. Um, so I had to quick go read up a bit on it. And, uh, you know, that that just happens and it's going to happen. Uh, with straight history, I always describe it as writing up to the hole. You know, you write and you write and then you realize, oh, hell, I don't know what happens next. Um, and you got to go find out. Um, so uh, it, it, it's a, you know, you research, write, repeat. That's how it goes. Yeah, I, I, I when I was working on my project, and again, it was alternate history. So I was even less beholden to facts than I think in, in historical fiction. But I don't know how anyone, I don't think I could have done it before Google. Like if I couldn't have just like gone to Google and typed in something for a quick reference, like, oh yeah, what was this thing like? That's close enough. Good. That's all I needed. And run back and start writing again. I don't know how, how people did it before that. Uh, 19th century novelists really deserve our, our great admiration. <laughs> they they um, were better than we are. Yes. Um, so, you know. Herman Melville's whale knowledge without Google is as astounding. Yeah. Well, he must have spent a lot of time in the, t in time in the tavern talking to people. Um, so another question from the chat. Uh, in researching your own ancestors, were you able to identify relatives you didn't know you had? or discover anything maybe you didn't know you had, I might add to that. Yeah, well, frankly, all of it. Um, you know, this, it, it's a, I'll try to do a short version of the story, but you know, the, uh, my mother told great stories about her family, but you know, a fair chunk of it was lies. And which may be true in every family. I don't mean to uh, particularly point the finger at her, but I, uh, she insisted they were French um, ancestors. And this, she comes out of World War II. That was an experience of hers. My father was Jewish. I mean, this was a sensitive thing, having German ancestry. Um, and she just denied it. And, you know, I went up to Waldeboro as a young man and researched it. And it was clear, you know, they were, it was a different name, but it was clear it was a German name. It was Johann Gottfried. Um, and I told her, and I think I just to jolt her, I said, you know, mom, we're crowds. Um, and she said, uh, no, it's not true. <laughs> so, you know, you, I, I didn't try to persuade her. So everything about it was a discovery. Um, and I discovered that, you know, they were basically failed farmers, which, you know, in Maine is a respectable thing to be. Um, and uh, got into carpentry which was smart. I mean, they just had a lot of woods and a lot of wood. Uh, and, you know, Waldeboro was a shipbuilding place. Uh, and, and that was how they developed. Um, I really got interested in this whole ancestry thing because my mother wore a ring that she told me when I was a young boy that it had been taken off a dead ancestor on a battlefield in the Civil War. And she just totally blew my gaskets with that. You know, it was like, the most romantic thing I could imagine, you know, this young man dying in the service of his country to free the slaves. I mean, what could be a more wonderful thing? And of course I discovered that there was such a guy, um, but he didn't die <laughs> and he didn't have a ring. <laughs> so, um, you know, when you sort of carve into it, you learn a lot of things that are interesting. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, she knew her great grandmother, who uh, is a character in book two. Hmm. Uh, and uh, the things she said about her, uh, most of those I think are true. So, you know, it, it, was, a, uh, it was a journey. Uh, I, it, it was interesting to watch how they decided to stop being German. This is a thing I think only white uh, immigrants can do, but they come over and they learn the language and they start changing their names. Uh, certainly in my family, that was done. Uh, and uh, 
So by the third generation, these the descendants of these Germans have first names like Emerson, <laughs> and you know they, they they're you know uh, taking on the coloration of their their new country, um, and and that is what you know uh, generations have done. I will say that I have a grandmother from Maine uh, who actually is from French descent because they were Thibodeaux who changed their name because they didn't want to be French in Maine to Kaya. Um, and then I also have another grandmother who told us our entire life that she was French only to ver a DNA test late in life revealed Lithuanian blood when she confessed that her grand, her father was from Lithuania. So yeah, we, we, it, it's, it's it, those, those immigrant times were, uh, uh, they, they didn't want to necessarily be known as the Lithuanian or the French. So it's complicated histories when you dive into it. My father's last name was Schwartz, so he changed it to trick all the anti-Semites. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so an, uh, another research question is, I guess, have you ever used or have you ever found the Library of Congress useful? I love the Library of Congress. Um, for my history books, it, it's a marvelous place. Uh, for this work, it turned out to be terribly important because I found a two volume history of this settlement. I mean, it was unbelievable. This guy had spent all this energy and he'd written a rather good book or two good books. Uh, and I could learn a lot. As I mentioned, I, I, I was very light on German stuff. I didn't know it. In fact, I misspelled, I spelled Johan the Scandinavian way the first time through and turns out that Germans spell it differently. Uh, but he had ever so much about that and it, it was terrifically useful and uh, the Library of Congress brought me to that. So uh, I'm a big fan of it. I've been, I mean, COVID times have been miserable for it, uh, but uh, you can get in now, but it's you know, nine to 12 and one to four and it's it's not the way it was, but so little is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, um, so another question from the chat. Uh, first, how many books have you written? And on average, how long does it take you from idea to final version? And does that, I, I will add, does that differentiate between a novel and a piece of history? Well, I'm going to assume we're talking about published books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've written a few that haven't been. Um, I've got five histories out uh, and uh, they take longer. Uh, the first four each took about two years. Uh, and George Washington, because he was such a massive subject and had such a big life, that took almost five. Um, so that's a big investment. Um, fiction comes faster uh, and uh, you know, these romance writers can pump out eight or 10 or 12 a year. And even, you know, good mystery writers do one a year. Uh, and I think I could keep up that pace uh, if I were to do only fiction. Uh, and, you know, these books, uh, The New Land and the sequels uh, are not a good test because at some level I've been working on them all my life, uh, <laughs> thinking about these characters. Uh, so they came pretty fast, um, and, and I wrote them sort of, I actually cut two of them I wrote during breaks from George Washington when I just sort of wanted to do something else, and I thought I had enough time under my contract to do it. So uh, those were more like six months. Never under underestimate the value of a side project, even if it's just a story while you're working on a big project, because sometimes that can save your creative life. Uh, it some it, you, you don't want it to turn into a slog so yeah yeah um uh this is kind of an interesting question and and specific and i like it uh from the chat during editing what is more common for you to cut text or add more more common is definitely to cut i uh, i try to write tight uh and i i get frustrated with writers who are you know, palavering and, you know, I, I want to just get to the meat of things. And I think most readers are like that. So I don't want to carry on, uh, you know, and in my histories, 
that often means just cutting, but sometimes it just means I stash it all into the end notes. So only the real uh, lunatics will read it. Um, the, uh, there are times though you have to flesh stuff out. Uh, you just have assumed something or, or left something out, just you know, missed an element of character that, that needs to be explained. Uh, and uh, or, or there's just a scene that's you know not right, uh, and, and you, you gotta gotta redo it. So, uh, but more often I'm cutting. I, f I feel like for for me it's like there's. I mean I, I'm a ruthless cutter. I don't save anything. I trim. I know people keep like documents or they're like it's gone. If I cut it, it's gone. But also I feel like probably in earlier drafts I'm more likely to add in earlier drafts where I'm realizing that a beat is wrong or there's a transition missing or something's missing in those early drafts. But once I have the right shape, then it's almost always removing, trimming the fat. So yeah, I, I see that absolutely too. Um, so how true to the facts do you stick to in your writing? Um, and I guess we're talking, uh, obviously the history is where hopefully 100% to the histories, but for historical fiction. Uh, there's a, a phrase I, I always use that I like, which is you, you can make up a lot, but Lincoln has to be tall. Um, you know, the things we know, um, you've really got to say. I mean, you, you can't make him a shrimp. I mean, it, it's just not going to be credible. Uh, you're losing your credibility. Uh, so it's important to remember that there is just, there are acres and acres of the past that we don't know, like most of it. So there's plenty of room. I mean, there are wonderful historical novels. I'm not gonna get the, uh, the title right, but I, I think it was like Louis Bayard wrote this one about uh, Lincoln a couple of years ago uh, as a young man. And uh, it's a terrific novel. And, I thought everything had been written about Lincoln that could possibly be written. You know, we have it. I know there's a 2000 page biography of him. He's been studied to death. We have, you know, Lincoln's first three court cases is one book. And then volume two is his next three court cases. But, you know, we don't know what he was thinking most of the day. We don't know what he did most of the day, who he talked to. We don't really know how he talked. And there's just so much, and, and Lincoln's one of the most highly documented lives in our history. So there's, there's a lot of room and it, it's not that hard to respect what we know. You know, I, I know when the ship arrived on the main coast, I know what the land looked like. I know, you know, when they fought with the Indians and I know when they went off to Canada. So it, it's no big deal for, to make room for that and to do that correctly. Uh, and then there's just so much left that you can fill in that is uh, where your imagination uh, really ha ha has a lot of room. And, you know, I will confess, I like historical fiction. And, and it's a phrase I probably shouldn't use because it, maybe it's demeaning to me, but it's kind of like having the guardrails of history um, that, you know, I know kind of what's going on and what the world is. Uh, and that uh, allows me to focus on the people and the character. Uh, I do think the key to getting a story right is, is character. Um, that's who we identify with. And it's, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, I do struggle with it. Uh, and uh, and that's where I, I want my energy to go. I, mean, I, I, I like that idea. And I'm thinking too, like maybe the appeal of history, history or historical fiction or alternate history is there's these gaps you can write into. There are these guardrails and they sort of push you in certain directions, but there are places that are just begging for dives because the information just isn't there. And, and it's compelling to have, to make up and provide a version of that information that might or might not have been plausible or happened. A lot of times there's silence in history because nobody wants you to know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably really interesting. So, you know, 
I, I love that. And I'm going to make a note of it. That's going to be, that's going to be saved in the notebook. Um, uh, so I wanted to jump to, to one, one thought. So this, I didn't give you a heads up on this one. So hopefully I want to talk about tone a little bit because I think there's a really great tone in this book. Um, and I was, when I was thumbing back through it, that popped me before we talked tonight. I, I think you sort of have this really masterful tone in that you're portraying harsh and bleak conditions, especially in the early settling times. Later on, you're portraying war uh, and, and conflict and violence. Um, so these are not necessarily happy, smiley subjects. Um, uh, but I didn't feel like this, some authors might've gone and really hammered with the oppressiveness, with the bleakness of the scenario. I didn't, I didn't get that in the book. I thought that, I'm not saying that was sunshine and rainbows, but it was definitely not like this heavy burden to read, even scenes where people are experiencing hardship. It was sort of hardship as, you know, if you're experiencing hardship, you're probably trying to rationalize the hardship away in some ways. There was sort of a feeling of, I'm experiencing hardship as someone trying not to be burdened by hardship. And I really love the way that tone was, was accomplished. Uh, all that's to, to go to a pretty simple question of how do you think about tone overall? Did you have a tone in mind when you began this project? Uh, and how did you think about maintaining tone as you were going through? Did you, did you want the kind of tone I described or was that just a byproduct of the material? If you'd asked me, I would have said that's the tone I want. Um, I can't tell you, I actually sat down and thought, you know, what, what will the tone be? Uh, it wasn't an internal uh, conversation. I think as, you, as I was listening to you describe it, a lot of that, I hope, and I think comes from the characters and the attitudes they had. Um, and I wanted, and I always want, frankly, in my stories, um, to portray love. I mean, it sounds trite, and it's hard to do. You know, Eric Siegel and Love Story just killed it for everybody because, you know, you just, it's, you know, that's so treacly and uh, nauseating. Um, but it's something that people show in small ways and that you see in quiet gestures often as much as um, big gestures and that it informs the characters. And if they feel loved, they behave in a certain way. So uh, it's a little highfalutin for me to get into, but um, that is, uh, th that's what is animating it for me. And with all three of these books, um, the uh, parts I struggled with was uh, the relationships and um, having them be real adults who um, don't always agree and don't always have the same goals, uh, but who, who share deep feelings. A uh, question from the chat. It sounded like your book is written in third person close point of view. How did you decide that versus say third person omniscient or first person? Uh, I like it best, um, and I've written enough. I can't do first person. I mean, I, I just can't sustain it. Uh, I, I turn into a, a smart aleck, and it, it's just not very good. I, I've tried it. Um, and uh, third person omniscient just feels a bit ponderous. Uh, uh, and third person close, what I, I do love being able to switch from person to person, um, and you got to watch that. You know, you could do it badly, and you know, confuse the reader. Uh, but that's um, because of you, I want to be inside their heads. I, I want to take you there. Um, I've, I've been thinking recently a lot about film and what a powerful storytelling medium, medium it is. <clears throat> and, you know, how do we survive uh, in a world that's overpowered by film? Uh, and we surprise survive, I think, because we can whisper in your ear and we can talk to you quietly and let you imagine what's going on. And it's collaborative. We're doing it together. We're creating this picture together. In film, we're just passive. You know, It's all rushing before us and there's no room for us. 
And if it's great, it's great. But I think with with fiction, especially, you have the ability to to recruit your readers. And, and uh, so, yeah, I I think too the the film. I, I love that take on film. But I also think that third person limited is maybe the most similar to the filmic perspective because it's not exactly the same. And I wonder too, if like our familiar, I mean, we're way more familiar with television and film than we are with reading. Even if we're avid readers, we've probably consumed more, more TV and more films in our lives. And then we, we've done books just on a daily basis. And I feel like that's, I feel like that def, there's sort of a default to third, third person uh, uh, limited. And it's a great perspective, right? Fun because it's, it, it offers these great switches in perspective, but also giving you the authorial narratorial control as 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 a semi omniscient narrator. Um, but somehow that's similar to film to me, and I think I think it works really well with the contemporary mind and how we are used to consuming media. So it actually gives really good access, uh, plus that next level access you're talking about. So we we recognize it, but then we're given that added thing you're you're, you're mentioning, and so I think it's really really effective as a not saying don't write others, other ones can be just as effective in other ways, but I think that's one of the reasons it worked for us. I, I, that makes sense to me. I, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, the way Dickens would, you know, set the scene and the, the social context and, you know, make, you know, 62 good jokes in the first two, two pages. Um, and you know, it's him, <laughs> you know, it's not the character, it's him and it's entertaining. It's great. Um, but I, 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 it's not uh, comfortable for me. And maybe it's because I've been shaped by what you're describing, the, the, the storytelling we most often experience. I mean, don't quote me on that theory. I don't have any real like, com- concrete evidence to back it up, but it seems like it might be no, irrelevant. Yeah, just write it and we'll, we'll all cite it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, welcome to academia. Um, uh, a, a quick question from the chat. How do you come up with a title for your fictional works? <laughs> uh, I had one agent who said you had to take them all from Conrad. Um, and he also insisted that, you know, that no title is, is uh, 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 copyrighted. So you can choose any one you want, including Moby Dick. But if you choose Moby Dick, it better be a good book. Um, he thought that was hysterical. Uh, I, I laughed about that because I've just discovered, I think, that the new land is actually a title um, in one of the Avalon series. Mm. <laughs> Someone may know that, but I don't. I, I saw it in passing, and I just discovered that my the second book is titled "The Burning Land," which gee, I thought, what a s- smooth title that is, and just you know hits you right where you want to be for the Civil War. And turned out Bernard uh, Cornwell well, has a book in his uh, Utrecht series that's "The Burning Land." Um, and I love, love his books, but I didn't mean to take his title. Um, but you know, there's only, uh, it, for the stories I wanted to tell, it was the right theme and I'm still okay with, with them. I don't think they're going to get confused. Um, and it, it, it's not an easy thing. Uh, I, I, my early books, I had a very high powered editor and she would just tell me the title. And after, I think it was by my third book, she actually started listening to me, which was great. I felt like I was growing up a little. Um, and now I'm pretty high handed. I mean, I, I come up with my titles now. Great. Uh, so we're, we're right about at the end of, the, uh, of our hour. So I did want to go to what we like to ask as the last question of our events to our authors, which is, what's one piece of it, write, writing advice you'd give to a writer just starting out? You can only be disappointed for one day. Um, it's fine to curse the universe that you didn't get picked for something or uh, this manuscript isn't going anywhere or that the review actually was unfair and unrealistic. Um, <clears throat> but on day two, get back to work. Uh, it, it, you know, nobody asked you to write that book. Um, you wanted to write it. So, uh, it, and, you know, the disappointments are real. I don't mean to make light of it, but 
you know, if you can't get past them, uh, you're not going to do good work. I, I love that advice. I think it's great advice. I'm going to use that advice myself right now. Uh, so you've given me a little boost. Uh, everyone, uh, David, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, please go buy a, a copy of uh, The New Land. It's book one of the Overstreet Saga. I believe you said book two will be out in May with a third book to follow that at some point. So uh, you have your reading, your reading set up for the next 12 months or so if you get this right now. So please, please go buy a copy. Uh, the link just got put back in the window. And David, again, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a, a wonderful chat and, and I've appreciated your insights. Thanks so much. I was delighted to be here.